perhaps I think we'll start by a little bit of a brief kind of intro to what is WPS and how do we get there. So United Nations Security Council's Main Resolution 1325, commonly known as the UN UNSCR 1325, was adopted in October 20, 2000. This is pre-9-11, it got adopted and that become, became the fundamental core over which other resolutions were piled to come to the WPS agenda. Um, and this uh, and provides a foundation of the International Women, Peace and Security, which is a WPS agenda. In the years since the passage of UNHC, UNSCR 1325, this agenda has been reinforced by the adoption of a number of further Security Council resolutions. Together, these resolutions draw the attention or to gendered impacts of conflict-related violence and advocate for the full participation of women at all stages of a peace process. There are four priority pillars in this agenda. And whenever you're reviewing any document, any security protocol from that lens, we try to review them according to these four pillars, how well this plan, whatever plan it is, at whatever level it is, whether it's a national level or whether it's a regional level, is fulfilling these four pillars. And um, these four pillars are first is participation, which addresses the pressing, pressing issues of women's political leadership in peace and security governance. So whenever there is peace and security issues, how you govern, so that would take the whole, you know, whole ambit of um, women participation at the policy level, at the subnational level, and at the ground level, where and and through all different kind of um, government institutions, law enforcement, politics, political elected elected representative CSO. So this is supposed to cover that. Participation, a second pillar is participation, addressing the pressing issues of women's political leadership in peace and security governance. Third is prevention, focusing on strategies to combat violence and especially preventing harm to women, prevention of violence towards women as well. Uh, the fourth is, the, uh, the, the third is protection, which is both the rights and bodies related to participation might in uh, to, uh, protection in measures to increase the women's uh, uh, protection against violence in violent and conflict uh, situations to protect women and provide them protection uh, during uh, conflicts. The last and the fourth is relief and recovery, which is uh, to ensure that adequate provision is made for the physical and mental health care of male and female survivors of conflict and related to sexualized violence in post-conflict environments and also basically to have women's participation and their needs are met during any kind of rehabilitation and relief that happens during uh, man-made disasters which are sometimes referred conflicts are referred as the question is how do we how do we approach uh, the whole question of gender gender equation in conflict and security in Pakistan. How do we approach this question? So the struggle for greater rights of women in Pakistan has unfolded against a background of conflict and growing trends of violent and ex violence and extremism. In the last 20 years, Pakistan and its neighboring Afghanistan became a key area of conflicts related to terrorism and violent extremism. These conflicts and security crises have had a tremendous impact on the lives of women and girls especially those living in conflict and post-conflict in country settings inside Pakistan. Improvement in women-friendly legislation at the national level and some of the findings that this overall analysis has brought to us is that improvements in women-friendly legislation at the national level are not sufficient in assuring peaceful and secure local environments for women and girls in conflict-affected zones especially in the ex fata districts. Uh, another finding of this section is that security policies at the national and subnational level have limited focus on gendered aspects of conflict and its impact on lives of women in conflict and post-conflict scenarios. Also, lack of participation and visibility of women in public and political spheres within rural conflict zones and at-risk urban communities obscures the importance of the role women actually play in generating social and political grievances, 
which contribute to the rise of violent extremism in Pakistan. Because women don't have public roles, for example, most of the terrorists arrested in these environments or the militants arrested in these environments are not, or not women, it's all men, it's all young men. Um, there is underplaying on the role that women actually play in the society, in the social, in the social context, which actually sometimes that role itself acts as a driver for violent extremism. So this broader link with gender and violent extremism is usually missing in most of the work that we've seen done in the last 20 years for the same reason, because we are always using a security lens and that security lens and using very securitized strategies, we are dealing with armed actors and people who are picking up guns, but and we are arresting, which are mostly men, the focus on how women push that agenda and lead that movement to, for the conflict to come to a point that shifts into terrorism is also completely missing. Against this backdrop, militarized counter-terror state policies, especially in the conflict zones in KP province and ex Fata region have further ruined the, uh, exacerbated the state of peace and security for women in peripheral border areas in the country. In addition, the securitized response of the Pakistani state to militancy and terrorism has left many women vulnerable due to deaths of male family heads, which has affected their social and economic well-being. And so when we, this basically relates to the counter-terrorism policies. And this again, is a, this is a finding not limited to Pakistan. We've seen really adverse impacts of uh, military-led solutions to terrorism, especially large-scale solutions, and an under uh, appreciation of how they actually impact lives of women who are also left out in also policy making when we are strategizing uh, to to develop policies and of, of countering violent extremism. Often, when we talk about terrorism and violent extremism, we encountering these strategies. Our strategies have uh, have have been our our countering strategies have been securitized to an extent where we don't look at the larger developmental roots of things, um, and we have bifurcated that conversation completely. And so, what what I have done here is brought uh, together or brought forward this point that. There are regional inequalities in countries. When we look at a country map, and if it's, for example, Pakistan's case, you look at it's a terrorism hit country, but terrorism and you know the, the impacts of terrorism, are, if you disaggregate them on regions are very different. We've had you know economically very vibrant cities, lives of women in cities, lives of women like myself who work and live in cosmopolitan centers in Pakistan are very different than the lives of women on the ground. And that low kind of a, and that the, the, the low equality, gender equality status of women in areas which are particularly conflict hit is very, very visibly strong. It, is, it has a, a correlation. There is a high level of inequality on, on the, in those areas and a little impact is taken as to how those policies are going to impact. Right now in Pakistan's case, Pakistan does not currently have a national action plan and no budget has ever been allocated for the implementation of any of the WPS strategies. The implementation of WPS concerns, however, does not require a formal national action plan, instead proposes actionable measures that could allow the elements of agenda to move forward. The government of Pakistan so far has not taken significant action in support of the WPS agenda, despite the presence of a few vibrant civil society organizations advocating for women's role in peace building. Lack of formal progress in signing onto the WPS agenda, however, does not mean that there, is, there has been insignificant progress on women-friendly legislation. Last two decades, Pakistan has made significant strides in improving key development indicators for women and introduce new legislation, adding new protection of women and girls. But my point, uh, earlier point that I'm making that those protections that have been added and the strides that women have made in Pakistan mostly affect women like me, who are urban based, who are in cities, who are studying in education, young women who are studying in educational institutions, 
most of the conflict areas women in conflict areas remain outside that ambit of those that legislation the women friendly policy responses fail to provide significant protections or inclusion of women in conflict environments due to the following structural factors specific to pakistan's context two structural factors i mentioned here which are specific to pakistan's context and these are missing focus on socio economic rights and gender inequalities which i've talked earlier there are structural barriers including poverty low human development patriarchal tribal norms restrict women's ability to access protections improve participation or play a meaningful role in prevention of conflict and violence second growing regional disparities in pakistan and conflict and security key development indicators in pakistan which have also been listed show uneven growth economic disparities across and within regions these disparities impact equal access of women to legal and regulatory safeguards and governance structures especially in conflict and conflict prone peripheral areas but talking about a uh, role of women particularly in the field of violent extremism um in pakistan the progress towards adopting and instituting uh, gender inclusive approaches for preventing and countering violent extremism has been minimal this is largely because limited direct involvement of women in acts of violence in the country up till 2013 only 9 out of 400 suicide bomb attacks in pakistan were carried out by suicide bombers this lack of direct involvement of women in acts of terrorism obscured the role of women and girl, what the role that women and girls have played and continue to play in the expression of violent extremism in pakistan the absence of women as active members of terrorist organizations such as al qaeda tehreek e taliban and tehreek e taliban pakistan also influence the design and implementation of development interventions focused on gender and pve cve in pakistan for instance a number of such women focused interventions women were mostly seen as victims of terrorism this is the case almost everywhere in the world i mean and this is i've engaged with with data and i've engaged with other programs on countering violent extremism there's a huge amount of focus on women as victims of terrorism um and how to safeguard women and victims of terrorism but women as agents as active agents was completely missing hence none of the strategies were targeted at women even in those same areas where you know their their men folk and you know uh, others were part young men were participating in terrorist activities in militant activities even then or the other thing which was very curious and it's not curious but i i'm so surprised that we wasted such a lot of time they were looked as gatekeepers they were after this whole mess of terrorism and conflict that is mostly led by policy makers as well as patriarchal actors on the ground uh, the burden of countering it or somehow as gatekeepers against terrorism was also considered domestic gatekeepers of terrorism was also considered women to be to play that role and they were considered that they were gatekeepers and they can identify and curb early signs of radicalization among children and vulnerable young men you must have heard all these various kinds of projects it happened in pakistan also focusing on women mothers on mothers countering violent extremism and i mean that was a was a lens that you know there's very little data to prove that any of that worked at all what is perplexing is that in the last two decades there have been several notable examples of women playing very conspicuous roles in violent extremism movements as fundraisers as social mobilizers in the community violent incidents related to there was this incident related to masjid e hafsa in in islamabad it was like the heart of islamabad was actually started by these really um very uh, aggressive very violent uh, young women in amadrasa who who took on a very aggressive role and it ended up in a big tragedy so that was again ignored largely ignored while we were setting up strategies and also even in sawat where the first insurgency happened in 2009 there was huge data telling you that it was the the that mullah fazlul ah who was the head of uh, ttp who is still part of ttp and hiding somewhere in in afghanistan actually started speaking to uh, women at home who were through the through the fm radio and encouraged them to kind of participate by in jihad by giving the jewelry and also 
uh, telling their men to to and their sons to go and join uh, the mullah. And it's a very interesting story. It was a very very intelligent, thought out campaign that that mullah led. And he spoke to women who were oppressed by their in laws and tried to provide them protections against oppressive family laws and stuff. And they became turned to them. So there was material, but still all this was ignored. The first time that we have really started talking about women's role in terrorism has been with the rise of Daesh in Pakistan. And which is basically mid 2014 is the first when, um, uh, you know, the uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi established the so-called Caliphate in Syria and Iraq and the global expansions of Walayat of Khurasan started happening in the Afpak region. And, um, you know, so the, and then splinter groups of TTP and Jamaat ul Ehrar acknowledged Daesh and Baghdadi's leadership. So after this, this is the first time that we started seeing um, incidents where uh, some of Pakistani women tried to leave for Syria to join the ISIS. Some of them were, were caught carrying material. Some of, some of them were caught taking um, you know, explosive material, carrying them around. And some were basically trying to get people together to leave for Syria. So this is the first time, um, you know, a lot of women were arrested even in Karachi running an Al-Zikra Academy, which was the Zikr Academy where, you know, usually women just sit and talk about it. And they were recruiting women to go to Syria um, for ISIS. So this had become by 2016, this had become a serious um, kind, of, um, kind of a trend. So that alerted the authorities and they started and others started before the authorities, but authorities, as you know, in countries like Pakistan, and the South Asian and even Middle Eastern countries are always the last one to, to, to react to it. Who reacted to this whole Daesh propaganda and outreach to women and inspiring the women were other militant organizations. So since that time, we saw um, extremist organizations like lashkar e taiba jamaat ud dawa lashkar e jhangvi jaish e muhammad These are very well-known uh, extremist groups. Some of them are on terrorist lists started ramping up the communication strategies uh, aimed at women recruitment and their causes. Um, so, and then we saw uh, a lot of really women targeted um, communication materials coming out, women targeted um, Facebook groups, uh, literature, sermons given in some of their seminaries, which were very highly critical seminaries, which had links with hardline organizations given very strong motivating summons from very great motivational speaker women calling for jihad. So we saw this whole kind of an explosion of uh, women recruitment by various other organizations. And that slowly kind of, you know, pushed Pakistani government to start at least looking at it by, again, from a very securitized angle, they started looking at it, looking at more intelligence, uh, you know, on women's activities, kind of following that, but not really any comprehensive view exactly why it's happening, what is this phenomena, what drives women, why do they join, you know, these jihad, very little was known, um, you know, about that. So what are the women related drivers of radicalization and be in Pakistan? What is the current, what does the current evidence tell us? Women's role in violent extremism in Pakistan goes beyond the commonly accepted role of women. Our evidence suggests women in different conflict scenarios in Pakistan play diverse roles within violent extremism, uh, extremist organizations in various regional settings. But although in Pakistan, only a small number of women have trained for suicide missions. Now there's a huge number with the Baloch um, fighters recently. Uh, there was a very big uh, attack carried on Chinese uh, language teachers in Karachi, which was led by suicide bombers. And now we have um, some evidence that the Baloch uh, liberation movement has actually trained a whole batch of women suicide bombers. So there is more and more appearing now. Most typically, women that engage with the organizations tend to play support roles that take two main forms, assistance to husbands, occasionally other relatives, brothers and sons, directly involved in VE activities, and help with the dissemination of VE ideology to others in family and community. 
Um, in Multan, our team found that several sources suggesting that women are assisting men in BE activities. Women in Karachi beneficiaries reported that school teachers from private schools in at-risk areas in West Karachi used tableau performances. To, now, these are not madrasas. These are just government and private schools, actually. They used tableau performances to kind of inspire young women to take actions against um, the Western um, war on terror strategies. They talked about Al-Qaeda. Uh, Afia, there's a Dr. Afia, there's a woman figure from Pakistan who has been arrested and is still in custody in the US for uh, being uh, for having links with Al-Qaeda. And they did a whole tableau performance against uh, around that. Women are also employed by some extremist organizations and heads of madrasas overseeing training and recruitment of women for extremist causes. Both qualitative and quantitative data collected provide strong evidence that women in Pakistan have a key role as social influencers and agents of change, both in supporting and spreading extremist tendencies in communities. And they also play a role and as a very important role in preventing and countering violent extremism. So they, they are dual edged, they are a very strong driver a social level driver. And also they can be a very strong tool for countering violent extremism also, but done in a proper uh, setting. This finding is linked to positive correlation between social factors, family and community and facets of violent extremism in the survey results that I've conducted. Uh, as I said before, women in Sawad played a key legitimizing role of the Taliban in the early years. Second point, Extreme disempowerment and gender-based violence is a push factor for women radicalization in Pakistan. This is a very strong data that we found and it's a very important data. There's a lot of talk about it, but very few studies have been able to collect significant data which show you this correlation. Quantitative survey results as well as qualitative data provided evidence that women ex-youth offenders were more likely to seek conflict or power as compared to men. This was extremely um, interesting finding that women who had already gone into or had supported violent extremism had very high motivation for seeking conflict even after being ex-offenders. I think there was a good strong percentage higher than men. Men once had become ex-offenders and they had left, they, they seemed to have gotten out of that whole phase and they wanted to go back into, uh, go back into more peaceful ways of living in the society. Women still retained a strong sense of that, you know, anger and, you know, propensity of violence, supporting violent acts if they felt injustice. So this is a very important fighting. This key finding aligns with current knowledge on women and violent extremism. Studies on BE trends in women in various parts of the world suggest that extreme social exclusion and victimization of women in patriarchal societies creates incentives for women to seek power and mobility by aligning with BE organizations. This is a key thing that we found almost in every context where we studied this phenomena. Women felt by joining violent extremist organizations when violent extremist organizations directly engage women, directly address them through Facebook, through, um, through, through social media, through, uh, through uh, basically through FM radio stations, as in the case in Sawat and TTP, and through written literature that is addressing just women directly, um, and also involving them into activities. Because in the end of the day, when you call them to a madrasa to hear a very kind of a violent, um, a mobilizing message, there is a social connection that's created. There is mobility. They are allowed to leave their homes and go to that spot. They are given jobs and responsibilities and they become feel like strong actors. So environments where women have very little, young women especially, have very little mobility out of their homes, the opportunity to join these VE organizations, to become an active player in these organizations, to be inspired and motivated those young women are same as men. They all need that. They need adventure. So this becomes an outlet for adventure, which in a conservative Pakistani rural tribal society, outside this whole ambit of 
extremist organizations and religious extremist organizations is just not a possibility for them. So that's a very important finding. Testimonies of at-risk ex-women offenders in Sawad described how the Taliban in the initial phase attracted their support by punishing male family members, especially in-laws who had subjected women to gender-based violence. So th their one reason for women to support is seeking power because once you get empowered, you get support against gender-based violence at home. You become part of something bigger. You become part of this other group that will provide you protection because there is no state protection. There is no social protection for women against uh, gender-based violence or home-based violence. So that again, correlation is very important and very interesting. Third, social factors, family networks are key pull factors for women and radicalization in Pakistan. Evidence from the field suggests family and community-based social networks play a role as we e pullers. So if your larger community is going to be um, you know, involved in kind of VE activities or support, say, use of violence to change the injustice that they're facing, whether it's against another ethnicity, whether it's against um, another group, or whether it's against the their own state security forces that impacts women also so you know women are part of that larger social milieu that questions those practices that we've seen in the past which i've mentioned before using them women from the same areas as gatekeepers and thinking that the mothers from these environments somehow are going to stand up against that no if their larger community and the family network is very inspired towards violence or joining violent activities or their brothers and sons are, women are almost as likely to be motivated by the same goal. So tell you women are political actors just like men are political actors. Women are social actors just like men are. They have conflict seeking, they have power seeking behavior in them. So that basically um, enables. Women ex-offenders as well as those at risk women who tested high on risk assessment scales used in our project, such as Vera 2 r This is a risk assessment scale that we use in our project to see how much risk these people pose for violent extremism. And these are international tools that are used in these programs. Um, were also related to family males who had been convicted of violent offenses or active members of VE organizations. As I said before, those women scaled very high on those you know, prove very or or were placed very high on those VIRA scales whose family members were very active and male members were very high. So there was no difference in 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 kind of propensity. Uh, okay, and now another uh, fourth uh, fourth point is women focus communication campaigns and strategies of VE organizations act as pull factors. So communication strategies that violent extremism organizations uh, are using to target women are acting as drivers. There, the data, especially on those who, uh, who became members of ISIS, because you know this came in 2014 and onwards when social media and use of social media has become more prevalent uh, compared to the earlier parts where only FM radios and women didn't have access to social media. And in peri-urban areas and smaller cities of Pakistan and bigger cities, Women have access to social media. There's more messaging, material is spreading around. And those messages that are not generic messages, which address women problems and place this whole issue of, um, uh, you know, mobilize them using their own problems and their own ideas and their own kind of context are very effective and acting as drivers. Some are used to target women in educational institutions. Other target women at home through radio, electronic, social media. So this has been used in success. Finally, madrasa affiliated with VE organizations play a critical role in radicalization of women. Not all madrasas, but there are certain madrasas which are mapped and have links with larger VE organizations and run by those militant organizations, at least in the case of Pakistan, those madrasas are still operating. Uh, the government has them on the list and, you know, they engage with them, but they occasionally uh, use those. Um, they, they play a critical role in radicalization of women to a point where they would use violence, uh, violent or extremist or use violence or support violence in their family members. 
Besides indoctrination of young minds, madrasas affiliated with V makes most noticeable con contributions. They often arrange visits, lectures by famous figures, um, and they are used to inspire women and men to join. So um, in conclusion, I think Pakistani state's response to the threat of organized terrorism and violent extremism has had a basically a very deleterious impact on women and girls, we can say, because they've used just securitized responses, as I've said earlier, especially in their military campaign in the bordering areas, which were very, very destructive. And there's a huge detail in the report if you ever have time and chance to read, please read it. Um, the counter-terror policies and security strategies of the government and security establishment so far have not understood the multi-dimensional impact that conflict has on lives of women. The analysis of role of women in violent extremism reveals serious gaps in the state's response and the missing elements in the broader PV or CVE practice and programs in Pakistan.